Good afternoon and welcome to the extemporaneous speaking final. At this time, will the courtesy core please close the door? Um, please refrain from leaving during the presentation and please silence all cell phones. First up, we have Jefferson City. Tariff, a tax imposed on imports. Imports a good bought in to the United States from another country. But why do we impose tariffs? In a world where we are increasingly reliant on trade with other countries, people often argue in favor of trade barriers in order to protect our domestic industries. According to the American Farm Bureau Federation, the average American, ta the average American import on agricultural products specifically is 5%, relatively low considered the European Union's average is 14%. However low, American farmers are challenged with raised input costs and lowered global product markets because of our, because of our trade tariffs. First, we have raised input costs. The United States has the technology and ability to produce everything we need in our own country. But as we learned in my e economics class, there's this thing called comparative advantages. Some countries just do things cheaper and more effectively than we can in the United States. It is better to specialize in something and produce that at a better rate than to try and produce everything ourselves. When we, we are forced then to import some things from other countries that go into the production of agriculture. If a farmer needs any sort of product to run their farm, some of that is more likely than not going to be imported from another country. However, a business's prime goal is to produce a product. So when a tax is imposed on them, they're going to pass it on to the consumer. They're going to raise their prices. Thus, take for example, molasses. The United States does not produce most of its molasses. So when, however, it's a product that goes into most animal feeds. So if farmers is producing any sort of consumer animal, they're probably gonna have a product that has molasses. Say a bottle of molasses is a dollar, and we take the 5% that makes it a dollar and five cents, and that goes into the production of their feed, and that's just gonna raise their feed costs. It's going to increase everything that goes into their production. And that either results in the farmers having less output levels or a higher price level themselves, which only passes on to the consumer. We also have a decreased global market for our farmers to sell on. The United States is the number one export of agriculture in the world. We produce more agricultural commodities than any other country. However, according to the Bretton Woods system, it is crucial that we increase our, our positive relationships with other countries. When we impose trade barriers on other countries, we alienate ourselves from the global community. Other countries are less likely to trade with us if we make it more difficult for their businesses to sell their products here. Trade barriers are imposed for either economic or political reasons. No matter what the reason is, it ultimately is gonna create harsher relationships between us and other countries. Thus, decreasing the ability of the farmer to export their products and sell it, thus losing them an entire consumer base for their products. American farmers face numerous challenges from US imposed trade tariffs. Agriculture is once again our number one industry in this country. However, as the world grows to over 10 billion people in the next 25 years, it is impossible and ineffective to try and grow everything ourselves. We must, work, we must work with our global community for the betterment of our farmers and our citizens instead of making policies which alienate ourselves from the global community and make it more difficult for our ideal industry. Thank you. Let me ask you this question mentioned is to protect is to the consumers pay for it. The consumers pay for it, you know, we ultimately retire. Which would be more important to protect jobs and the consumers pay a higher price or consumers and, and or not have the jobs protected and the consumers pay a lower price? What's your feelings on that? There's often the thing that if price levels rise, 
real wages actually decrease. So the money that you get in your salary buys less than it would when price levels were lower. And so a lot of the times politicians see that as a reason to raise wages. However, if you raise wages, that's once again an input cost for the producer. And that means that they're probably not going to be able to employ as many people. So really either way, when we cause any sort of chain reaction where price levels are going to increase, that's going to result in one way or another of people being unemployed or not being able to afford the things that they need. You talked about the trade deficits and the tariffs. Um, what has happened in the last 18 to 24 months to the agriculture industry as far as current trade and, and deficits? I know recently there was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The, um, the United States has a significant trade deficit with China, but it's mainly manufacturing. Like I said, agricultural specifically, we are the number one exporter of products in the world. And so there actually is a trade surplus as far as agricultural products. And so overall, when we create those partnerships with other countries and increase our trade with them, we're equaling the trade imbalance and we're kind of bringing it further up because especially with that Trans-Pacific Partnership, we're exporting a lot more agricultural products to them, which is kind of lessening our deficit just a little bit. Um, right now in the vegetable industry, uh, Mexico is sending a bunch of uh, vegetables into the United States. In your opinion, what can the government do to help our U.S. farmers out as far as to, to secure a, a more uh, stable market? So right now we're part of the North American Free Trade Agreement, normally known as NAFTA. Um, and that means that we can't impose any trade barriers on Mexican products. And so the United States has a higher minimum wage. And so, of course, our production costs are going to be higher, meaning our products are going to be more expensive and, like you said, less competitive than the cheaper products from another country. And so I believe that if we're going to make our products as equal with theirs as we can, then we need to remove ourselves from NAFTA in order to kind of level that. And so it's possible to have a trade equality without being completely free. There needs to be some regulation in some form or fashion. So Samantha, as it relates to agriculture, if you're sitting at a table and you've got two buttons in front of you, as it relates to agriculture, red is no tariffs allowed worldwide on agricultural products, green is yes, tariffs are allowed worldwide on agricultural products and you get to make the decision which button you want to press? I get to make the decision for global agriculture. I would overall do no tariffs because like I said there's always better for a country to pick whatever they have a comparative advantage in and what they can produce most efficiently and I think if we have free trade in it a country is going to see that there needs to be items that they specialize in and things that they can do better the United States has numerous things that we do better than other countries, but we can't grow bananas. That's something, just one example, that's in the Caribbean and it's going to cost a lot of time and energy to try and grow them here. So I think if we have no tariffs and we have this free market, we have the ability to point out and countries to figure out what they're best at. Right. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the extemporaneous speaking finals. Um, at, please do not get up and leave during the presentation. Uh, keep your cell phone silent and we have um, Pickens County up next. Good evening. My name is Emma Long and today I will be, in, I will be delivering my speech entitled excuse me, entitled Increasing Agricultural Literacy Through FFA. Some kids love superhero movies. 
something about the hero always coming in to save the day. Some kids love action-packed thrillers with cars racing down the boulevard. And some kids, like my dad, always loved watching westerns. I think it was the gunslingers and the outlaws and the old tombstone. But me, well, I think I've always just kind of been the exception to the rule. I love 80s movies. I know 80s movies isn't exactly a genre, but to me growing up, that's what was in the VHS. I think that my fav one of my favorites was definitely Indiana Jones. Something about his passion and love for archaeology and then the crazy situations he could get himself into. Let me let you in on a little secret. I even had the brown hat. But while I loved Indiana Jones' great adventures, I think that my personal favorite was Back to the Future. I think it was really interesting even then to see what people believed that the future would be like in 2015. And while we don't have flying cars and shoes that automatically mold to our feet, we do have something else that I think is pretty amazing. Advanced agriculture. But you see, with these advancements also come some deeper issues. A lot of times, people don't quite understand what these advancements are, and sometimes people get a little lost in the figures. So, what can national FFA organizations and state organizations do at conventions to help increase agricultural literacy? There are three things that come to mind. The first being allowing public communities to attend general sessions at conventions. I know from a personal standpoint, as a kid who sits in those sessions, I get to watch some of the more intimate parts of agriculture in the FFA, which seem to go hand in hand. I believe that if more people in the community could really see what agriculture in the FFA is all about, that we can do some pretty amazing things together. And I think that it would give them more of an understanding of what agriculture really is, and maybe help them to be able to want to get behind our cause. Another thing that I believe we could do is to invite more legislators to our conventions, whether they support agriculture or not. I believe that it's important that our business leaders and that our legislators really understand what we're all about in FFA and agriculture. In fact, here in Georgia, we have a wonderful ambassador program. I know that one of my personal friends, Corey Arborough, this weekend will get to lead around Governor Brian Kemp through our convention. I think it would be great if all the states as well as the national organization had some kind of program like this to implement in their own processes. The last thing that I think that we can really do is to have a wonderful portion of time for our FFA members to talk about their SAE to people in the community and also important leaders in our nation. From personal experience, I currently serve as the Area 1 North Region FFA president. And I know for a fact that there's nothing more amazing than getting to talk to a middle schooler about their supervised agricultural experience. I think that one of the best ways to really help people understand what agriculture is really all about is to let them hear it from the youth of the program. After all, we are the future of agriculture. So, in turn, whether it be inviting legislators to convention, or allowing public sessions of convention to be going, or even just setting aside a little portion of time for people to talk to our members about agriculture, I think that there's a lot of things that FFA can do for the future in ag literacy. And in my opinion, agricultural advancements are way cooler than flying cars and shoes that automatically mold to your feet. And agriculture is our future. So let's show people why. Thank you. Emma, you mentioned about inviting people to come. How do we explain to them that it's not a bunch of, I'm going to use the term, redneck kids in their blue jackets, and it's not about sows, plows, and cows. It's how, do they, how do we communicate that to them to get them to walk through the door to come to our conventions? I think that one of the best ways we can definitely get people to come to our convention is to advertise maybe the more advanced sides of agriculture. I mean, a lot of people don't really understand how much goes into the personal field work as well. 
but I know for a fact um, I'm currently in an advanced placement biology class and I've learned so much about what agriculture and agri-science really is all about. For example, genetically modified organisms get a really bad rep and I think that if we can throw something like that out there and explain what it really is, then I think people will come to the doors and try to learn more about it. Um, whether it would be to learn more about the topic itself or just to come and find interest in it, you know, to learn more about what they think they should do about it. And I've heard uh, Georgia Commission of Agriculture Gary Black talk more than once about uh, that, that agriculture ourselves, we're real good at talking about agriculture, we're not real good about talking about food. How do we, how do we reach the general public uh, and help them make the connection uh, that, that agriculture is food and fiber and not just some nebulous concept out here. How, how do we connect those dots with the general public? Well, I think the best way that we can do that maybe is to reserve a special program on the TV. I know that um, National FFA had a Super Bowl commercial at one point. So things like that I think are a great way to reach the general public, but I think that it should be filmed in the field rather than on the stage. You see, I think that people sometimes don't really put two and two together that it's farm to plate and not business to plate. And so I think that that's the best way we can definitely implement that into society and the general public. You mentioned one of the ways was having public community attend the conventions. In your opinion, how would we go about doing that and not losing our atmosphere that we have? I think that the best way we could go about doing that is maybe to not to isolate, but to have a designated section for public people to come in of course, here at Georgia, we have a wonderful security system and wonderful security officials who help go through and check and make sure everyone's clean and all that sort of stuff. But I think that we could definitely implement that as the public comes in as well, if we can get them interested. But I think the best way to do that would have a section and that way they could still see what was going on and not really be so caught up in the middle of all the kids having a good time as well. In your opinion, how can uh, FFA on the state and national level, levels use social media to help educate the, the general public? On? Well, um, National FFA, I currently follow them on Instagram, and I know that during National FFA week, I was a little bit disappointed because I really was hoping that we would get a farm fact every day. And I think that that's one way that we could really make public some of these more gray areas, I like to say, of agricultural literacy. And so I think that if we can really implement some more farm facts per day, maybe get our names out there and encourage our members to post stuff on social media as well, because our members' reach goes far beyond the national FFA. And so I think that if we can get our members on board with us, I think that we can definitely do some great things. Let's, let's jump back to, you mentioned the GMO thing, and yes. you know, the resistance to that. And one of the challenges, and this goes to kind of his question too about food, how do we get people to understand the technology in agriculture is vital to feeding a growing population that we'll have in 2050? How can we how can we use FFA to better tell that and get that message across to the public? Well, I think that one way we can definitely do that is to try to implement a basic ag program in every school across the nation. And I think that everyone should be required to take at least one basic ag. I know this may sound unrealistic or silly, but I know that for me personally, basic ag got me into the FFA and really taught me what I wanted to do when I got older. Um, I really didn't know if I wanted to go into agriculture or music, to be honest with you, until I hit sixth and seventh grade. And so I believe that if more people can be exposed to that classroom setting in the, F in the FFA and basic ag and really get a good understanding of what it's about and a good foundation from a young age, I believe that that would help our community more than anything. I also believe that if we had an advanced placement agricultural class that that could help. If students learn that they can get college credit for an elective in college with an agricultural class, I believe it would encourage them to take it. And I know personally that I've learned a lot about genetically modified organisms in my biology class because it is such a controversial issue right now. And so it's something that I believe could be crossed between two different classes as well. I think that's all the time we got, so thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon and welcome to the Extemporaneous Speaking. Um, please don't get up during the event and please silence all cell phones. Up next we have Michael from Pelham. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, big fish. Okay, how do fish even get that big? Now, this imaginary monologue can be simply explained with the concept of genetically modified organisms. But then the question arises of what are genetically modified organisms and how are they used in agriculture today? In order to break this subject down further, we will discuss what makes a GMO a genetically modified organism, its current and potential uses in agriculture, and the very massive controversy surrounding the subject. Now, for my first point, in terms of GMOs, it's a, con it's a consistent consensus that GMOs are any type of organic organisms that have been genetically modified to promote certain or other desirable traits. Yet this definition is very controversial, considering the fact that you, humans have done artificial selection throughout thousands of years to get other selective traits, such as through dogs or other type of corn varieties. Yet the modern consistent consensus is that lab alterations have inserted artificial genes into a particular organism. Now, these definitions continue to vary through regions and countries, but for the purpose of today's speech, I will focus on the USDA consensus on what the definition of a genetically modified organism is. This leads me to my second point. The potential uses of GMO include reduction in the amount of tolerance for specific herbicides or insecticides, more specifically in soybeans. This is already in current use with the concept of being reduced in resistance to different types of Roundup or Glycerol herbicides. This can also be used in corn, which has different resistance to different insects due to the natural production of enzymes, which would be similar to types of insecticides. More specifically, and this is a little bit more of an astounding point, is that corn can be genetically modified and currently is to produce enzymes that would be used as vaccines for oral implication to prevent hepatitis B. The implications for this in third world countries would mean a less amount of resources needed and less doctoral training to be sent over to third world countries to prevent spread of plagues. Now, this can also have a continuation in the concept of animals and faster maturation rates and larger nutritional sizes, as well as higher amounts of nutrition. For example, in milks and cows, they have already inserted proteins and enzymes and genes that would increase the production of human growth hormones, which of course has led to larger human sizes. Yet, with all of these many pros, there are, of course, many very substantial cons that are potential with this subject, which leads me to my third point. Around the concept of genetically organi um, modified organisms, there's, of course, no lack of media controversy and publicity. The whole concept of there being controversy comes from the fact in the very high dangers of horizontal gene transfer, which is basically the idea that any type of isolated genetically modified organism would cross-pollinate with native species and would therefore wreak havoc as it procreates in the natural environment. This coming to the very head in a 1988 study by a private research university known as Lousley, in which they took Bt corn and placed it on milkweed to determine if there was any connection between the recent integration of genetically modified organisms such as corn in the environment and the reduction of monarch butterfly population. What the study found is that the milkweed coated in Bt corn pollen had a significantly higher mortality rate among the larvae. This, of course, sparked a wildfire amongst social media, proclaiming how GMOs could potentially devastate the entire Earth ecosystem. In response to this, the United States government, along with the USDA, did independent research and looked further into the study. What they found was that it was kind of exaggerated. The whole concept was based on the fact that there was increased amounts of Bt corn pollen, as they said, ludicrous amounts. However, the connection with B or gen genetically modified organisms and destruction in the environment could not be understated. It had been set out there. Of course, this controversy con furthers with the concept of religion. In terms of veganism and, veg and Hinduism, with the concept of using animal genes in varying vegetables and fruit would, of course, completely ratify how they eat and what they look at and how they view themselves as moral. This continues with the concept of philosophy and morality with the concept of are we ready and do we have the right to play God? 
Of course, whatever the controversy and whatever the pros and cons, it ultimately leads to one conclusion. That no matter what the controversy, no matter what the pros and cons, it comes down to us as the consumers and as the people who we support, what we buy, and what we buy into in terms of research. It's only going to take us to decide the fate of humanity in the concept that you cannot deny that GMOs are going to drastically change the world. Whether it's positive or negative depends on how wisely we use this new technology and implications to better further ourselves. Thank you. The um, challenges to GMOs, a, a lot of them are, are, don't seem to be science-based, correct? Yes, sir. Um, how, do we, how do we educate people to what, what genetically modified or, ge or genetic engineering, uh, how, do we, how do we get change that mindset with the public to understand the potential for the genetic, genetically modified crops or pr products and the advantages of them and what the long-term impact can be in a positive way? How do, we, how do we change that perception? Well, this can kind of be brought up to the fact with the recent movement of anti-vaccination. This has kind of brought about an almost anti-intellectual movement because of a disillusionment with science in society. There's kind of been a complacency with how we teach students in schools and expose them to current possibilities and capabilities of research potential. So in order to, as you say, change the viewpoint of the public, there needs to be further exposure and I guess you could say kind of education on the fact earlier on in life to expose them to the negatives, yet also the positives, and educate them on the fact that in order to get more positives, there requires responsible research and innovation that would lead to safe practices, if, if that makes sense. And I'm going to throw you a little question. There's another term that we hear mentioned, CRISPR. CRISPR. Yeah. Do you know the difference in it and what we call genetically modified? Is it the same or, or is it a different type of process? Uh, I believe CRISPR is a concept that's used for artificial insemination into specific genomes, where they would use the, the protein to move into the cell structure and carry along an artificial set of genes and place that into the cell structure as it multiplies and the ergo causes the organism to be genetically different. It's a, it's a process in which they change the organism and it is connected to GMOs, if I am not mistaken. With all the GMOs and, and the altercations of these crops, are you seeing any residuals that are being passed on through, say, like the feed going into the animals and, go, and going back into the land later as a byproduct? That has also been a very hot dis discussion. Is horizontal transfer possible? And further research by the USDA found that it is technically feasible, but only under certain conditions where there would be excessive amount of pollen. And that has been another argument in the case is that the potential for cross genetics would be nearly impossible with the amount of pollen in close proximity and close environment that would be required in order to transfer genes. Scientifically speaking, it has not been statistically proven that horizontal gene transfer is possible or is currently happening. But the concept of it working in a very closed and very high active environment is possible. All right, with, with Monsanto slash Bayer, they're, they're going through some uh, lawsuits right now with uh, herbicides on GMO products. And they, they're saying that the herbicide is causing cancer. What's your opinion on that? Uh, my opinion on the cancer research is that many, there are pos there's been shown to be carcinogens as well as in DDT and other type of glycerides that would be in herbicides. Of course, the concept would have to be about the usage and the amount of it. Of course, there's always dangers whenever you're using a herbicide or pesticide because it is a potential carcinogen with any particular toxin. The important amount is the amount of lethal dosage that is required and the amount of safety that's put into the product. Um, I do feel like it needs to be revised and that the company itself possibly could look into different revision on safety standards and the application processes. For example, Roundup has now introduced a uh, type of selective imprinting in which they have a stick of wand that has a type of gel padding and you stick specifically on the leaf. This is probably the most selective use of herbicide that I've seen and probably will reduce a lot of exposure to people as well as in the environment. So different implications and usage with the current um, pet herbicides and other pesticides would be a great benefit to the company. 
Michael, over here, the, uh, the, the words genetically modified organism, or in particular the acronym GMO, has become so politically charged and, and socially charged. Is it too late, particularly as it relates to food and animal agriculture, to, to find a different term or label other than GMO for that process? Um, I do believe when the concept of as culture evolves, there's many terms that evolve from face to face, such as different dances, routines to memes, or even types of pop culture references, or even names of dance moves. I don't feel it's too late to rename the product, but I feel the major problem isn't necessarily the name, but the culture that's associated around that. And I feel a better solution to the problem would be to further educate the populace about the pros as well as the cons, and the responsible choices need to be made in order to maximize the pros and negate the cons. That's all the time we got, got for this one. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Good afternoon and welcome to the extemporaneous final. This is our fourth speaker. If at this time the Courtesy Court will close the door. Uh, please refrain from leaving during the event and please silence all cell phones. And our last speaker from Ware County. So, you're going to ag? Are you wanting to play with pigs and roll around in the middle of nowhere? My college professor asked me this as I informed her I was attending the state FFA convention. After that, a student asked me, so, you like country music? You like to wear overalls and sing howdy do? No, I don't. But sadly, this is a very common misconception around agriculture in today's society. The everyday citizen doesn't understand just how much agriculture encompasses, and it makes us as agricultural enthusiasts look rather bad. People think that we are people that carry pitchforks and like to wear overalls. They think that we enjoy rolling around the hay and feeding pigs, but there's so much more. There is ag communications, there is planting trees, and we need to do something to tell these people exactly what ag really is. An example of this is me being able to participate in Ware County's Ag in the Classroom. I get to go to every second grade classroom in all across Ware County and speak to these young individuals just about what ag truly is. Being able to see their faces as I inform them that cotton is what made their shirts and that John Deere was an actual person and not just a tractor. Doing this is rewarding in and of itself, not only in that I'm able to inform them of something so important, but also in the fact that Without this knowledge, they're going to continue in this cycle of misconceptions of what ag truly is. Agriculture is not being on a farm. Agriculture is not wearing overalls. Agriculture is everything. Nothing you can point out to me in today has no correlation to ag. Either directly or indirectly, ag is all around us. Another way we can combat this typical misconception is through things such as CDEs, which everybody participates in. We do this by having FFA members who may have never done anything go to that forestry field day or compete at that poultry judge and CDE. They think to themselves, well, I know who I'm gonna be around. And they get there and they realize it's so much more. They realize that you don't have to be on a farm to have a place in agriculture. You can plant a tree. You can identify a tree. You can do something as simple as Tell if that egg is really okay to eat, but it's also even more. You can write a newspaper informing people of the newest farmer's bill passed. You can go forward and be an advocate and teach others about this. You can even just talk publicly about the need for ag literacy and that in and of itself is a part of agriculture. Agriculture is everything. We cannot exist without agriculture, and yet we're in a society where people believe that we are just farmers on a hill in the middle of nowhere. This is a problem as it will deplete 
our future numbers as who's going to join an industry where they think they have no part in it. When in, react, in actuality, almost everyone in today's school and in today's society is in some way contributing contributing towards the overall ag industry. We need to combat this through different things in the ad advocacy towards combating ag illiteracy because ag illiteracy is the stem of all of these problems. Ag illiteracy is why we have people thinking that when I say I'm an FFA, that I'm a no good for nothing country person. That is why that when people, my dad says he's a logger, that people just think he is good for nothing just for cutting down trees. These misconceptions are what is keeping us back and what is keeping us from truly prospering and getting all those talented individuals that are growing up today. These are the problems that we need to solve and we need to solve it now. Thank you. Emma, you mentioned, you mentioned the illiteracy problem. I mean, I'm a, I want you to, you said your dad was a logger, but what really got you involved in FFA? I began involved with FFA in sixth grade when I walked into my first middle school orientation. I did it because I live on a farm, my parents in a farm, but most importantly because my mom said, I was in it, I grew, you need to grow too. So my mom sent me in that classroom and she said, you need to take this at least one semester. You may not like it, but you will learn something from it and it'll benefit you forever. I took it and I learned what an impact it has and can have on countless individuals and I ran with it. Now, how would you go to another student in your school and carry that that enthusiasm and interest? What would what would be some things you could do in your school to try to get other people involved in ag pro, ag classes? I personally tried to instill this mantra that every person I come into contact with, I at least in some point of our conversation mention something about ag whether it's that I'm a chapter officer or I'm competing in a CDE, I bring it up. That ignites them to say, well, what exactly is FFA? Because most students don't really understand what we do. And after that, I make it my goal to tell them exactly what FFA is and that it is not just for the farmers. It is not those who want to pursue a direct job in the ag industry. It is for people who want to be speakers. It is for people who want to be writers. It is for everyone. And so I encourage them by showing them that even though they think they don't have a place, almost anything that you want to pursue has an outlet in ag. One of the things that you talked about was participation in CDEs as part of a way to combat this literature. Um, how in your opinion, which is, which, how does the ag teachers need to work to encourage more of their ag students to get involved in CDEs? I feel like it first stems from getting once again past that common misconception because even in our today's ag classes, there is a very big problem of students being placed in these classes without actually having any desire to go into ag. So I feel like ag teachers should take that initiative and push past that misconception, whether it be encouraging them to come to a meeting to see exactly what we are about, or just instilling those principles that FFA truly possesses and what a CDE truly encompasses. I feel like the more knowledge we are able to place with these students, the more power it will overall have. The worst thing in the world is not understanding, and because of this, I feel like knowledge is power, and teachers, by thoroughly and re-explaining everything and all that CDE has to offer, is the ultimate way. How, how can ag teachers get, make students at the elementary level more aware and ready to join FFA in the ag classes once they hit middle school? Well, our chapter personally has, once again, ag in the classroom, and we have reached out to not only second graders, but we have also now started reaching out to kindergartners through our kindergarten ag fun day. By doing this, we're hoping to plant that first seed because the younger they are, the more impressionable we are. And we want to be able to plant that seed before their outside factors are influencing their end goal. If we are trying to reach these students where they are still learning and growing and absorbing everything around them, because if we don't get to them then, they're very unlikely to join it. And so our mission is to try to reach as many students as possible. So we're slowly expanding through the grades, but we feel that reading to the second graders about various instances such as this year was John Deere That's Who which highlighted John Deere's 
life story. And then last year it was about cotton, and it was the process of how cotton turned into our T-shirts. We find that small doses of information and them realizing that it is so much more than what they think it is, is the best way. The topic you drew sort of reminds me of that phrase that, that, that we've all heard a lot. Uh, we have met the enemy and, and it is us. It, it relates to the AGAD program, the FFA organization, particularly at the, uh, at the high school level. I think all any of us recognize that we have to do is, is, is go to an event, whether it's a livestock show or forestry field day or Sunbelt Ag Expo. And, and a lot of our students, a lot of our members uh, are, are focused on looking the look. You, you, you've you got to have the right jeans, the right boots. You've got to have the skull circle in your in your blue jean pocket. And, and I, I understand that individuality, but as it relates to the general public, I think sometimes we in agriculture are our own worst enemy. How do we how do we counter that without, particularly at the high school level, stifling that individual individuality of students so that uh, that they do recognize that whether they realize it or not that they are being watched and agriculture is being judged by their appearance and their actions. I feel like there's a vast majority of ways we can approach this. The first is my personal approach. I choose to be me, which is our individuality. And me, one day, may be that stereotypical plaid button down with flare-legged jeans and some boots. But then it could also be me in Converse, skinny jeans, and just a regular t-shirt. I feel like our approach should be setting an example. I feel like we should be, if we want to see a change, we should be that change. We should act, not react. So I feel like the way to do it is to talk to those leaders in every FFA chapter and every student that has power because we may be one person, but if our one person can ignite one more person, we can initiate a domino effect. So I feel like it is encouraging that person to be the one to step out, the one to prove that it is possible to not be the stereotypical country person and still be a wonderful, excelling member of the FFA. I feel like this is the best way to do it as People seeing one person taking that initiative may weaken the resolve of someone trying to fit in because ultimately we do want to be accepted and by being the one to stand out, we're able, able to help let others do as well. Thank you. All right, I think that's all we got. Thank you. Thank you.